Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm here to read another chapter from the book I've been sharing with you guys, Incredible Answers to Prayer by Roger J. Mornew. Um, sorry, I haven't been up here earlier to get this book read. Um, you know, as I always say, life happened. <laughs> And it did, and it will continue to happen. So I just do the best I can. But I am here. Um, so we are on Chapter 7. And Chapter 7 is called Interceding for Young People. Um, I made the mistake last video. I think I messed up and said that um, we only had two more chapters to go. But in reality, I have three more chapters. There are nine chapters in this book. So seven is going to be short. This is going to be a short one. And then eight and nine aren't too long either. So we are going to be wrapping this up pretty quickly here. I'm just going to get right to it and read this for you guys. So interceding for young people. In the previous chapter, I stated that a young man by the name of Robert obtained victory over drugs and returned to God's commandment honoring people as a result of intercessory prayer in his behalf. I would like to tell you a bit more about his experience and how the Spirit of God cared for and blessed his life during the time he had drifted away from God. It was a sad surprise to learn from one of Robert's former college buddies the almost unbelievable changes that had taken place in this young man's life. In a few short years, he had gone from being a, being a God-loving young person to one dedicated to total self-centeredness. Robert, his college friend said, is no longer the sharp young Christian you knew him to be. After college, he found employment that brought him material prosperity, and in addition, his wife's income placed them on, it, on easy street. They made friends with some of the, the people that they were working with, which gradually led them into places of entertainment that they had not known before. The wife became fascinated by the music, and before long they were both hooked on rock. The, they occupied their leisure time with activities that not only separated them from God, but eventually from one another. Whether he left her or left, or she left him, I don't exactly know. The college friend added, his brother told me that Robert had $1,000 worth of grass and other powerful stuff in his place. He spends hours smoking grass and he loves heavy rock. I'm just pausing for a second. You can totally tell that this was taking place back in the 70s just by that in itself. Kind of funny. Um, in fact, he has sunk thousands of dollars into a top-notch stereo set to create the impression of being near the stage of a rock concert. When I expressed my disappointment, the young man replied, don't feel bad about him. He knew better than to get himself involved in that type of situation. It's obviously what he wanted or he would have stayed away from it from the beginning. Naturally, I immediately determined to take Robert's case before our Heavenly Father on a daily basis. Knowing that sin can be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. I prayed that the Holy Spirit would bring Robert victory over rock music, liquor, and drugs. Naturally, I realized that it could possibly take years before the man could reach a position where he could make decisions that would lead back to God. But I prepared to pray for him for the rest of my life. Three years went by, and then one day, I had a lovely surprise. I met Robert on the grounds of Union Springs Academy as we were attending the annual New York Conference camp meeting. The next day, I had the joy of hearing from him how the Spirit of God had worked in his behalf. It was about a year ago, he told me, when I began to experience a change in the way I reasoned regarding my friends, my leisure time, my musical preferences, and other aspects of my life. Up to that time, I had, sur I had spruned spiritual things, and for a period of five years, I had given myself up, up to enjoying what the world calls the good life. From that time, 
that I got up each morning to when I retired at night, I was either involved in some kind of self-gratification or living in anticipation of it. For instance, the very first thing I did each morning was play some of my favorite rock music as I got ready for work. There was something about it that satisfied an inner craving. Every weekend was taken up with a wild party roaring with women, liquor, grass, and whatever else could liven it up. By then, my wife and I had parted ways, and I was completely free to do whatever I wanted, and I loved it that way. But suddenly, I came face to face with reality. Would you mind telling me about it, I asked. About a year ago, things began to change. First, my rock music and my beer went flat on me. One evening, when I arrived home from work, I turned on the stereo set, placed a stack of favorite records on the turntable, then sat comfortably with a glass, my favorite beer, in one hand and a newspaper in the other. I took a couple sips from the glass, read a few minutes, but when I had a third sip, I sensed that something had gone wrong. The mouthful of beer tasted bad. In fact, it was awful. I went to the refrigerator for another can, and after opening it, I found that it tasted worse than the first one, and the music was not the same. Something was missing. It wasn't enjoyable as it had been, so I checked the controls on the amplifier. They were all set correctly, but the rock music had, music had lost a great deal of its appeal, and I could not zero in on that missing element. Just then, the doorbell rang, and there stood Henry, a close buddy. Henry came to visit after at the right time something strange is taking place and i can't figure it out after pouring the rest of the last can of beer into a glass i handed it to him tasting it henry pronounced it's excellent i told him that mine tasted less than good let me taste the beer in your glass i can't believe you after taking a mouthful he headed for the kitchen sink then sputtered that was putrid awful stuff man you have a real problem here and i can't help you I don't know. I don't want to scare you, but I believe that a supernatural force is at work here. By the way, I came to borrow one of your tools for a couple days. My interest in Robert's experience was naturally mounting, and I couldn't help asking him what he thought of my friends of his friend's comment about the supernatural. My first thought, Robert replied, was that someone had been praying for me and the Lord was doing something to get me to give some serious thought to the, my way of life. The experience kind of stunned me, and from that day on, I could no longer drink beer. As we chatted, he gave me additional details about the incident, but I was most impressed by what he described next. A couple of days after the beer incident, I almost lost my life. It was November evening, about 8 o'clock, and I was driving down a small hill. Since it had been raining and the road surface was beginning to freeze in spots, I had slowed down to about 35 miles per hour when suddenly four deer jumped onto the road. The headlights startled them and they halted in the middle of the road. Instantly, I slammed on the brakes and the car started to spin like the top on a glass table. It kept going in circles without hitting the shoulders of the road and continued all the way to the bottom of the hill. After the first turn, I saw that the deer had vanished, but there was no way of stopping the car. After a couple of hundred feet, the road was level again, and the car slowed down, slowed right down, and came to a rest sideways against a guardrail. It was on the driver's side of the car, and after regaining my composure, I looked over to the rail with my flashlight and saw a drop of about 80 feet. When I asked him what thoughts went through his mind when he realized that he was safe, he replied, I felt impressed that someone's prayers had been answered. Naturally, those two experiences started me thinking very seriously about the fact that someone valued my life more greatly than I did. Sorry, I just need to turn the light on here. It also encouraged me to return to God when I realized that while I had given up on him, he had not abandoned me. From that time on, I found myself weighing what I was doing in this present life against the reality of eternal life. I had a lot of backtracking to do in order to get on the right road again. Drugs had a powerful hold on me, one that I knew I could not break myself, but I decided to talk the whole matter over with Jesus and follow as he would lead, and lead he did. Today I'm a free man again, 
having had victory over self, over sin, and over this world. Robert's story strengthened my prayer ministry and helped me acquire more completely something that I had been seeking for a long time, an unfaltering trust in my Heavenly Father and in the power of His Holy Spirit. Reflections. I don't agree with those Christian parents who assume that if their sons or daughters depart from the Lord, there isn't much that we or God can do. Because the young people are exercising their freedom of choice. Such parents believe that all they can do is pray, the Lord will watch over their wayward children. Such reasoning can have disastrous results. While it is true that God will not force their will, yet through our intercessions that, that claim the blood of Christ, his spirit can overrule the forces of darkness and control events in such a way that the ones we are praying for will be helped to decide for right even if they have to experience something, some suffering. Let's consider Samson's experience. I can imagine how distressed Manawa, I think that's how you say her name, that's Samson's mom, Mana, Manawa, I'm probably saying that right, and his wife, oh, that's a man, I'm sorry, that's the father of Samson, and his wife must have been when the boy they had brought up for God began to associate with idolaters. For 20 years, as he ruled Israel, he kept repeating immorality. And then one day Manoah came from the city and told his wife that he had some real bad news, that she better sit down, as she would be shocked. He stated that the Philistine rulers had put out Samson's eyes while he was visiting a prostitute. I'm inclined to believe that while Mrs. Manoa felt terrible at hearing this news, she wasn't shocked to the extent of believing that God had failed them. Surely they prayed that God would somehow save Samson in his eternal kingdom regardless of what it would take to bring their son to his senses. In prison, Samson did some serious thinking, scene after scene of his childhood, days passed before him. He turned to God with his whole heart, and in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, we read that he will stand before God someday with all other champions of the faith. Wow, that, that's the end of chapter seven, guys. Um, that was, a, that was um, very powerful right there at the end there. Um, honestly, because uh, I can so relate to, I have six kids and, um, you know, my, my, uh, you know, some of my children, my older kids are not in the place I would want, I, you know, that I know the Lord wants them to be in their hearts and in their walk with the Lord. So as a mother, I am constantly lifting my children up to the Lord. And, um, you know, he makes a really powerful point um, in saying that, you know, we need to, how did he put it? As Christian parents, we assume, um, like he said, God will not force the will of anybody yet through our intercessions that claim the blood of Christ. His spirit can overrule the forces of darkness and control events in such a way that the ones we are praying for will be helped to decide for right, even if they have to experience some suffering. Now, maybe some people don't believe this way, but I, I do. I do, and I when I pray for my kids or whoever I'm praying for, honestly, um, 
whether it's my kids, my husband, my a family member, or just somebody that I felt inclined to pray for, um, I pray, God, your will be done in their life. Not theirs, yours. And even if that means... I, or one of my big, one of my, you know, things that I say a lot is whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it takes to bring that, to bring them back to you, Lord, to bring them to their knees, to bring them to you, Lord. And I know for me personally, in my own personal um, experience, it took some really, really hard stuff for me to get to get, get on my knees and repent and um, you know, humble myself before the Lord. So I speak from experience. So, I mean, it is really powerful guys. And, you know, we, we never, never give up hope. Never. And, um, always intercede in prayers for loved ones, children, spouses, parents, friends, whatever, whoever, um, and um, know that the powers, the Holy Spirit is stronger than the powers of darkness. And when we go into spiritual warfare for people, because that's essentially what it is, um, and we go up and we ask the Lord to intercede on people's behalf, know that, you know, like the word says, um, his word will not return void. So know that, that there are things, you know, things are happening. And that's, that was a powerful part, even about the, the, you know, the, the young man, Robert, how the beer tasted gross to him and, and the music just wasn't <laughs> giving him those feelings that it was giving him before. I mean, that's powerful. And you know, the Lord can do those things. He truly can. Now, does, does the Lord always do that? No, you know, everybody has to go through a different, you know, process. Um, and sometimes it does take years. Like, like he shared with this, the story of Samson. It wasn't until, look at what it took for Samson, you know, to, to finally, surrender to the Lord, you know, so it is powerful guys. And just, you know, we not, we need to never lose hope. Um, and know that God is good and that God, um, hears our prayers and he asks us to pray for a reason. It's not a waste of time. It's not something that is not, you know, it's, it's, it, it is something we are called to do. We are called to do it. So I pray this, this, uh, inspires you guys. I pray it. I pray that it motivates you guys to intercede for people in your own lives. And like I said, guys, chapter, um, eight will be coming very soon. Okay. God bless. I hope you guys are all good out there. God bless until next time. And remember guys, there's always a reason to smile with Jesus.